If any of you are downtown and walking along a certain street where there's a certain bookshop called the Faith Mission Bookshop or any other Christian bookshop in the city, and you see this little book, John White, Eros Defiled, I recommend it to you. It'll help a lot of you who are sexual sinners. It'll help you greatly. It is the most helpful little book I have ever read on the subject. It's got an apple on the front with two holes in it, so you can identify it. John White, The Christian and Sexual Guilt. And I'll be quoting quite a bit from that book this evening because I've got great help from it. I recommend it to you. Eros Defiled by John White, published by the InterVarsity Press. Genesis chapter 2 is our first reading, verse number 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. You'll find 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. Go to the Revelation, turn left, and you'll come to it before long. Start at Matthew, turn right, and you'll come to it soon, for those of you who are not familiar with the Scriptures. If you even haven't got a Bible tonight, we're so glad to see you. Thank you for coming. Look on with someone around you. 1 Corinthians 7 and 1, and I'm reading the authorized version. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, and that generally in the Bible means premarital sex, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time. There may be times when you will draw back in your life uh, from physical union in your marriage. For what reason? That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. And we'll turn over to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones, and for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see 
that she reverence her husband. Thank you for your patience again in that reading. Listen very carefully. This is a great congregation, and if you give me your attention and be in an attitude of prayer throughout this service that the Lord will speak to your heart while we study it. For I have some things to say that are exceptionally sensitive. Not everybody may agree with me, but I tell you this much. What I say, I speak from the heart as in the sight of God. The times, they are a-changing. It doesn't even take Bob Dylan to show that to us in a song. This week, I received a taped message from a young man who used to attend this class. He married a lovely Norwegian Christian girl, and he now lives permanently in Norway. And on the tape, he pled with me to do something. It was an hour's tip. He sat down at supper time in his home in Bergen, probably a fortnight ago, and while Nina was making the supper and giving it to him, um, a toasted sandwich with cheese on it, he tells me, he talked to me about the needs of his heart. He gets tips for every week from this place. He has 90 of them at home. And as he travels over Bergen, driving a grocery van for a kind of a Marks and Spencer type store in Bergen, he feeds on the word. So if you're listening to me, Gary, watch the traffic lights. I'm talking about you. Concentrate on your driving. But the Lord used you this week, my old friend. Because as he sat there at the table, he talked to me about something he felt that I should talk a lot more about at Tuesday night. He pled with me to preach God's Word regarding the current moral climate. He did not know, to my knowledge, that that is the subject for this present series. And on the tip, he told me that recently, on the front page of a Norwegian newspaper, there appeared the picture of a state-registered Lutheran pastor holding a pornographic magazine in his hand. Underneath it, the Lutheran pastor was quoted as saying these words, or tantamount to this, there is nothing wrong with this. After all, we came into the world without any clothes on, didn't we? And a leading detective in this city came into my home this week and sat down in the corner, and he told me that I could name him in public. I'm not going to, but he said, you can quote me in public if you want to. I'll stand over what I'm saying. He told me that he has recently been rest, uh, rested by the police authority from working in the area of terrorism in Northern Ireland, where he has been a detective for the last 10 years. And they are resting his mind and resting his heart from that very intensive work. And he said, they told me that I should have a little rest, go to the police college for a while, come back home again, and go into ordinary CID work. And he said, I've come back, Derek, into ordinary CID work in Northern Ireland for the last fortnight. And he tells me that after two weeks, the last two weeks, he is sick to his very heart, in dealing with sexual offenses in Belfast. In fact, as he talked to me, I could hardly drink the coffee we were drinking together. I felt sick too. And we're not talking about young men either. We're talking about older men. If you think that this series is just a little talk about the birds and the bees, as we say, for a lot of teenagers, you've got another thing coming, my friend. I want to talk to the whole generation that lives here at this time.
young and old. Well, of course, books have been explicitly sexual for years, haven't they? Pornography in Ulster, never to speak of Norway, is rife. Sir Alistair Burnett very sensitively told us in news at 10 last night when ITN investigated it, and I could have jumped up and shouted, praise the Lord for those boys. Not always a time I do that, but I could have done it last night because they bust a pornographic ring wide open in London. Terrific. The police didn't know about it, but they found out about it, where they were exporting pornography to America. Only it was child pornography. Nudity and symbolic sexuality have been for some years common on the stages of the West End and around the country. On the stage, in reviews, and also in experimental ballet. And have you noticed that censorship standards fall as human standards fall? And censorship standards come down to suit human standards. And Western society is saturated with sexual stimulation. We talked about that last week. And attitudes and new philosophies. Now, in the middle of all of this kind of a situation, what is the church's response? What does the church do? Well, it does a lot of shouting. It's up in arms. It has fierce indignation about what's going on. But there is also in some areas of the church in the West the very opposite extreme. Either they shout against it or they compromise with the morality around them and make concessions to it, as the Lutheran pastor has done and thousands like him. I've even read it in a leading evangelical magazine here in Britain, where in a letter in it, and I'll spare those who publish it because I'll forgive them for it, I think it was an error, where a leading evangelist with a leading evangelical youth organization said that he kept pornographic magazines around the house. There was no harm in it. We might as well know, preachers, what's going on. And when I read it, I couldn't believe it. But I'll spare the organization, and I'll spare the magazine just at the moment. I haven't seen it in there since, and I hope I'll never see it again. Unfortunately, this is the problem. And many, many leaders will say, well, you know, I mean, let's have a look at it. Let's see what they're producing. We're not afraid of it. As if to play with fire and stick your hand in it and you'll not get burned, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. But of course, there is another problem as well. Most conservative preaching on this subject gives to its audiences something. What does it give them? It gives them, by and large, very little else than a moral facelift. But you need more than a moral facelift. And if I know my heart in an adulterous and wicked generation, I need more than a moral facelift. What you and I and Western society in particular desperately needs tonight is a Bible-based morality. Morality isn't old-fashioned. People will say, well, you know, it's, it's old-fashioned morality. It is not old-fashioned. It is not a new morality either that I am offering, although it may be new to some of you. 
in that you haven't heard it before, because I am appalled, heartbroken, at the lack of guidelines that are given to young people on this subject within the evangelical fold. It's incredible how woefully ignorant they are in it. It's not a new morality. It's not an old-fashioned morality. Morality, my listener, is ageless. Can't put an age on it. Its roots are in a God who is the same yesterday and today and forever. But slowly, almost imperceptibly, and very frighteningly, the feeling is gaining ground that sexual relations should not be condemned between couples who are serious about each other. After all, we are in love. We are very serious about each other. So sexual relations are okay. A friend of mine at a university in this land put into a computer a whole lot of information he had taken from a questionnaire amongst evangelical young people, and it came out a very big percentage agreed with that philosophy. He was shocked, and so was I. Now, let me keep a balance. Let me keep a proportion. We are seeking, I am seeking, Hundreds of you tonight are seeking for truly Bible-based morality and sexual purity in our lives in a sexually immoral generation. But let not the Christian church become obsessed with sexual purity to the extent where it's preaching away at that and against that, and it doesn't condemn pride in the church. You could be sexually pure and rotten with pride. Lying between Christians. And worst of all in these days, it seems to me, the deadly problem of gossip. Are there any gossipers? Sometimes I think like Christian ones. Resentment, malice. Let's not just go overboard on the one subject and not condemn the other. And I think that over the last eight years almost, we have talked about those things. I was very loath to go into this subject at all because it is sensational, and one can be very easily accused of using it to get a crowd in. But I think you know I haven't done that because the crowd was here under the Word of God long before we got to this subject. That's what we wanted to show first. I thought, Lord, I'll get James Dobson's films in on marriage, focus on the family. He's terrific on it. We'll go and get some great preacher somewhere who really understands these problems of marriage. And the more I thought about it, and the more I got before the Lord about it, the Lord said, you're going off on the boat to Tarshish, aren't you? You're a little Jonah, Bingham. You want to go off to sunny Spain instead of Nineveh. Get into your own city and preach in it my word, because I put you there. And I honestly believe I'm talking to you tonight, and I say it humbly before God. He's listening to me at the direct command of the Lord. I believe I have a message for you tonight from the Lord. I dare to believe that, that he has called us to talk about this at this time, else I wouldn't do it. But in dealing with our subject, it is vital that we ask the right question. Let me not ask you tonight, when are sexual relations wrong? Let me be positive. When are sexual relations right? Within what context are sexual relations spoken of with approval? Well, those passages I read to you tonight show very clearly where they are approved of. The wholesomeness and the propriety 
of sexual relations within marriage are explicitly affirmed in those passages. Now, listen carefully. Not that you're not listening. In fact, you're listening very well. Where temptation to immorality arises, the Bible recommends marriage as a solution. One translation of 1 Corinthians 7 and 9 reads, if they cannot control the sexual urges, they should get married, since it is better to get married than to be tortured. You never thought the Bible talked like that, did you? The Bible knows all about you. The Bible knows the torments of your heart and soul and the temptations that come to you. But I know you're looking up at me tonight and you say, what a low view of marriage. That you get married just because you are tempted to immorality? Surely Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 has a very, a very sort of chauvinist attitude. That if a man cannot control himself, then he should get married rather than than burn, as the Bible puts it. But friend, I want to tell you that Paul has not got a low view of marriage. In that chapter of Ephesians 5, Paul says very clearly that he has a very high view of marriage. If you marry a girl, sir, and you are a believer, you are to love that girl girl, your wife, as Christ loved the church. You say, how did Christ love the church? He loved her to the end. He laid down his life for his bride. And there was no question of divorce. If I thought my Lord Jesus were going to divorce me tonight and flirt with someone else, to use a phrase reverently, to give his affection to something other than his church, would I worship him? No. I tell you, he cannot do it. His character is such that he is pure and sinless. He will never, ever, ever be faithless to his church. He loves her and loves her to the end. He gave his precious blood for her. He died for her. And how does she behave? I tell you, she flirts with a lot. And down through the centuries, the bride of Christ has very often wandered far away from being faithful to its heavenly bridegroom. Has he deserted her? No. He has wooed her. He has chastised her. He has, by his Spirit, drawn her back into his way. So, if you're thinking about getting married, fella, think long on Ephesians 5. Do you love her that much? If you don't, don't marry her. Do you love him that much? On the other side, girls, as you contemplate marriage, is that the standard for my life? I know Satan's listening to me tonight. He'll have a go at me before the week is out. Ha, ah, you said in public you should love your wife. Has Christ loved the church? Will you do it? By God's grace, I'll try. Will you? We may have failed in the past, many of us, but let us come back to the standard, and because the standard's there, let us not shirk from it. Husbands, I speak to you from my heart to yours. Did you treat your wife as Christ treated his church today? 
always thinking about her, always planning for her, making provision for her need, trying to ease the pressure points in her life constantly at all times, thinking of her and loving her as you love your own body. Is that the way you behave? I'll never forget one day lifting a phone to ring a man. And I, when he lifted the phone, he had just finished a sentence where he was scolding his wife. And he said, Ah, oh, hello, Derek. And I caught the last bit and the first bit of the next sentence. Oh, the change that comes when a man stops scolding his wife to talk to somebody on the phone. Or vice versa. true. So don't think that when the Bible speaks, when you are tempted to immorality, that marriage is a solution for you, for many of you, that that is a low, physical, carnal view of marriage. It is not. Ephesians 5 shows you Paul's view in the spirit of marriage as he teaches the church how she ought to behave. Now, we have made the point before, and here we go into the controversial. I have thought long about this, friends, and I speak with my whole heart. We've made the point before that a sworn commitment between two people before witnesses provides the framework of all that we have spoken of. They are sworn to each other, if you like, that they will love each other until death parts them. That's the framework within which sexual relations happen. But of course, the whole point that's now being raised is, is it necessary to have a public commitment at all? Would not the commitment, sworn commitment, in the absence of a, the public institution of marriage make a physical union holy? In other words, get down to Shaw's Bridge tonight on the way home. You might know where that is or somewhere. And you stop on it. You put your arm around your girlfriend and you say, you know, I promise with my worldly goods I thee and die. Dear help you, dear, but whatever. I promise that I will marry you and I will be faithful to you. And this is now my promise. And she promised it to you. I will. John Stott said when he came about the fellow recently in London at the public marriage service, wilt thou take this woman to be thy, thy wife? And he said, I wilt. Well, <laughs> I don't know whether you'll say that or not, but you say, could we not say that sitting in the car? Is that not in the sight of God just as real if we mean it? as to have a public ceremony where public, the public are present, or some of them are present? Is that not as real in the sight of God as this institution? Many people are trying to say that and say, if we, if we vow to each other we'll be faithful in private, then that makes physical union between us holy. Well, this is a big subject. In the Bible, there is nothing equivalent to our modern period of engagement. The betrothed couple were, as it were, married. But the marriage had not been consummated in a physical union. They were married, but it hadn't been consummated. And for that consummation, the bride would be taken publicly to the bridegroom's home. An appropriate feasting and celebration would precede that occasion, sensitively carried through. The example of that, of course, in the Bible is that sacred story of Joseph and Mary. They were betrothed to each other. 
And that is why Joseph's dismay at the possibility of Mary's pregnancy was so great. Mary, of course, was conceived of the Holy Spirit. She had a supernatural conception. Christ was given a natural birth, but a supernatural conception. And the word adultery might have been more appropriate to Mary in his confusion. Because in Hebrew thought, this betrothal was indeed marriage, not yet consummated. That's why there is that great dismay at this situation. And what a wonderful story it is, how the angel appeared to him and told him all that had happened, and not to fear. The whole, and I want us to really get this in God's presence, the whole Hebrew concept of time is different to our concept of time. Their time was everything has a purpose. We read it last week. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to weep. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die, and so on. Everything has a purpose. Every time has a purpose. So their point when they are betrothed to each other is, let there be no sexual relations until the time for consummation has come. And that's why it's so beautiful and so wonderful. Now, of course, here in the West, we don't have that kind of a, a situation so much. Engagements are broken and so on. But given that we have it now and that uh, this engagement system is used, how should couples view their engagement? Should they not use their engagement time to explore each other's hearts and certainly not each other's bodies? A time to explore each other's minds. A time to explore and to discuss the goals of their marriage. A time to discuss their interests, their duties, their finances, the Christian behavior they're going to have in the home the training of their children, their likes, their dislikes. And I know what I'm talking about. I was involved deeply in full-time service for the Lord, as we put it, although we're all full-time, but as a preacher, giving my full time to preaching. And when I moved into engagement with Margaret, we had to show very clearly the kind of life that was coming up ahead. In fact, when I asked her to marry me, which is a fascinating story, but I'll not tell you about it. <laughs> Boy, did I ever pray during that time when I was awaiting an answer. <laughs> I can tell you from my heart to your heart that in all that time, before we discussed, when we were discussing getting married and the whole situation and would she marry me, of course I would have to lay out before her what it would be like in the house of one who gives themselves to the Lord's work in this way. That their time is not their own. That it is a very difficult and public position which has tremendous pressures that we trust in the Lord for every penny we get, that we know not what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and Satan panics when we move out in the Lord's work. And, you know, it was just absolutely amazing that she said yes to all of that. 
But now when it happens, and now when we're in the battle together, and the work rises beyond all we ever dreamt of, and the pressures are tremendous, are we glad that during that engagement time we discussed it all and set out our goals? I can tell you that it so often happens in my family that when the Lord is blessing me in public preaching, everything goes wrong at home. Again and again and again, when I'm away on some campaign or out of the country or whatever at weekends or working or, or even here at home, that's where the battle is. And I tell you, fellas, many of you are thinking of service for the Lord in this area. You make sure that that girl that you marry is one who loves the Savior more than she loves you. Because when you're in the battle, there is no treasure like it than to have a wife who is behind you in all you're doing. That just doesn't apply to the Bible teacher or evangelist. That applies right across the world. Boy, when I think of Billy Graham going through England in those campaigns of his in the summer, and I happened to be sitting in one of his meetings, and I looked behind me, and his wife was sitting right behind me in the meeting with cancer in her throat, in her esophagus. And I saw that poor lady just out of operation, and there's that fella. He couldn't even go home for his wife's operation because of his huge commitment to the Lord's work he dare not pull out. I tell you, we need to pray for people like that. I think of Billy in Moscow tonight, preaching the Word. But I think of his wife, Ruth, at home in North Carolina. And it just doesn't apply to a high-profile figure like that. I think of many a Christian woman tonight who lonely is suffering for the Lord and cannot have what many other wives have because of their husband's commitment to God's work. So I'm saying to you, make sure that that girl loves the Lord if you want to serve him. Better having it out now straight than to go into marriage and find it all wrong. I speak from the heart. But of course, that's not how the world views it all, is it? No, don't. Of course not. The world thinks I'm mad, thinks the Christian is mad. How does the world view it? They have something that they call situational ethics. You say, we used to have one of those, but the wheels fell off. Well, let me tell you about situation ethics. It's a big word. A situational ethic denies that morality can be codified. Right or wrong must be defined by the elements of the situation in which I find myself. It all depends on the situation. Premarital sex under certain circumstances they teach is right. Under other circumstances, it's wrong. It all depends where you are and the situation you're in. But you know, it's not that men in this generation have found a more superior ethic to the Christian ethic that they grab to justify their immoral actions. I'll tell you why we have had this sexual revolution, not just because of the pill. We have had a sexual revolution because men don't like what they read and hear. And John 3.19 says very clearly, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. 
And don't you think that it's just because of a, of a situational ethic that men are different? No, no. They love darkness rather than light. Of course, they'll come to you and they'll say, but I'm in love. They will say to you, it feels so right. Well, a steak feels right for me. I would just love one right now. Go get it, Joe, for after the meeting. Chinese sell them up the road. I love a steak. But if I have an assignment to fulfill for the Lord, which demands my mind and my heart and my concentration, and I stuff myself with a steak at lunchtime and I'm sleepy all afternoon, there's nothing wrong with the steak, but there's everything wrong with having it at that time. But it feels so right, you say. What a strange philosophy. Just because it feels right. You know, men in the world, they speak of making love. Making love. But I want to tell you that love is about the last thing that they make. All of this premarital sexuality, they say, is making love. It's no such thing. Premarital sex blocks the very communication that sex was designed to promote. Mark my words. Love for a believer in the Lord Jesus is more than pity. It's more than compassion. It's far deeper than an understanding. It's far more positive than just self-denial. It is the agape love of 1 Corinthians 13, the love that originates in the heart of God, and the love, note this, that cannot stop whenever the love object ceases to please them. Mark that. True love is a love that doesn't stop loving whenever the very object of their love ceases to please them. As C.S. Lewis put it, not everybody will understand this. You can still love a person even though you don't like them. Think about it. And when you have that kind of love in your heart, my friend, then you will see no irrelevancy in the Bible teaching against premarital or extramarital sex. There's no irrelevancy in it. But of course, the psychologist would have a field day with me. They say, you see that fella down there in that pulpit with that old-fashioned philosophy? The psychiatrist and the psychologist would say, you are talking to those young people and you are repressing within them bodily instincts to such an extent that it's unhealthy for their mental health. There would be people accuse me in preaching this of harming your mental health. I know my wife worries about my mental health sometimes, but you know what I mean, don't you? They say repression is unhealthy. Ah, but there is a huge difference between repression and suppression. Repression is unhealthy. Repression is born of fear. Repression is born of guilt. But suppression is not only healthy, it's necessary for my emotional development. My sexuality has been given me of God. Pleasure was not, pleasure was not invented by the devil, you know. It was God who created it. My sexuality has been given me of God. I'm not to be ashamed of having it. I don't feel guilty because I have it, and I should never feel afraid of it. But it needs to be suppressed and trained 
with God's help, for the real place in my life which God arranged for it, and to prevent me from becoming a sexual slob, which a whole lot of people are. And suppression is very important under the Spirit. Paul talks about keeping my body under. The Lord Jesus can do that for you in your life. Believe me, he can, by the power of his Spirit. Let him by his Spirit's power yield to him, and he will control you. Because 1 Corinthians 6.13 says, the body is not meant for immorality. That's not what it was created for. The body, says the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6.13, was meant for the Lord. My hands, my, my, my shoulders, my feet, my body, my members, every single one of them were created for the Lord. They're for him. And I am to use my members as instruments of righteousness, not as instruments of unrighteousness. So the purpose of your sexuality is that you might know intimate love, my friend, within the secure and growing framework of marriage. And any other use of it will not free you. It'll enslave you. Oh, I know the devil will go mad when I say this. He say, that's, that's not true. It is true. Whenever you engage in premarital or extramarital sexual relations, you are engaged in an activity which directly contravenes God's purpose in creating your sexuality. And therefore, it limits your freedom. You say, I never heard it put that way before. It does. You want to be free? Be free under God's framework. And if you're free under God's framework, there's no telling what will happen. In blessing and bliss. But break out of God's freedom and say, I have my own freedom. Let the devil take tomorrow, says Christofferson in his song. For tonight I need a friend. And the devil not only takes tomorrow, he takes tonight as well for sexual acts outside of marriage are written, it seems often to many people, with indelible ink on your memory. You want to be free? Why, said the Christian poetess, Lord Jesus, make me your prisoner and I shall be free. You also sin, not only against the Lord, but when Corinthians 6 teaches, you sin against your own body. That is, you do something detrimental to the very purpose of its creation. You're harming yourself. Doesn't feel like it, but it is. So what do I say to you? Ah, may God give me compassion. I trust I don't stand here arrogantly because, as I always say, as my mummy taught me, when I point the finger at you, there are three coming back at me. What must you do? If you've been involved in these things, you must break it off. You must break off those sexual relationships. You must, and you must do it tonight. Now, in your heart. You say, well, there's a possibility that my partner will break off the relationship altogether if I break off the sexual relationship. Well, if that's the case and he leaves you, let me say to you, you've been selling your birthright for a mess of pottage. If that's all he thinks of you or all she thinks of you. I know that a breakup will leave a very deep wound in your life. It'll not heal tonight. It'll not heal next week. It'll not heal next month. It may not be healed by next year. It may be many years before it's healed, but that breakup may well leave a wound. But I want to tell you that God will lay his hand on the wound and he'll heal it gently and he'll heal it more sweetly than you've ever dreamed. And he'll set you free. 
tonight is the night for hundreds of you to get this right before God. I confess in public tonight that I have a real problem with the third point on your sheet. What is marriage in the sight of God? What is it? This is a very, very thorny question, and I want to tell you that I have been sitting in council with men from all walks of evangelical life as they have discussed this, and my mind has boggled as to some of the things they present on this subject as to what marriage is in the sight of God. So I'm going to make my stand for what I believe. Is premarital sex marriage in the sight of God? No, it isn't. Marriage, to be marriage, must be entered into as marriage by both partners. In Genesis, men took women in marriage. The contract was carried out in the presence of witnesses and in accordance with local customs, as I've already said. Now, premarital sex is sin. Right? We've seen that. It is sin. Now, let's look at one of the most useful verses in all of the Bible on this subject. Hebrews, please. Hebrews 13 and 4. And I hope you're all right there in the overflow, nice and warm. Your steaks will follow soon. Or something, we hope. Hope you're all right up there. Thank you for your patience. Hope you're turning with us. Hebrews 13 and 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now, what on earth does this mean? Well, learn this well in the presence of God. If premarital sex is a sin, and marriage is honorable, that is, marriage as an institution, where then did this idea come from when a single person has a physical union with a person they say they're in love with, and they commit a sin with them, that they are married in the sight of God. If marriage is honorable and premarital sex is a sin, then premarital sex is not marriage. It's very important. And of course, what the phrase means to imply is that if you have sexual union with somebody, then you ought to marry that person. Because you have had that, you ought to marry them. And that brings a dilemma, doesn't it? Which person ought you to marry in this kind of world we live in? The first one that has had it happened with, God forbid that it should ever have happened to you, but if it has, I talk to you. The first one that you have had that with, should you marry that person? And that brings in another dilemma. What if you weren't the first one for him? And what if he wasn't the first one for her? And go down that road, total confusion. So you see, here is a big problem. Behind the mistaken notion that premarital sex demands that partners marry is a wrongly understood Bible command. Twice in the Old Testament, the command was given to a man who seduced an unmarried girl to marry her and to pay her dowry price. Exodus 22. Exodus 22 and 16. Write that into your notes, by the way. What is marriage in the sight of God? Hebrews 12 and 4. Exodus 22, 16. If a man entice a maid, 22, 16, that is not betrothed, and lie with her he shall surely endow her to be his wife. And if her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. Deuteronomy, please. That's Exodus 22, 16 and 17. Deuteronomy 22, 28. If a man find a damsel 
that is a virgin, 22, 28, which is not betrothed. And lay hold on her, lie with her, and be found. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver. We're still at Deuteronomy 22, 29. And she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his life. Now, out of those two texts, people have brought this, that premarital sex is marriage. If that happens, you must marry them. Now, the girl has obviously been very publicly compromised, and it's very obvious in these days that her chances of a respectable marriage, as in this day, are reduced by what has happened. And her price falls. Her dowry price falls. I know some of you smile when you read that dowry price, and you wonder how much your dad would give for you or whatever. Well, the dowries were there. The account in Exodus makes it clear that marriage is not absolutely essential. The father of the girl has a lot of say in the matter. If he doesn't want that marriage to go ahead, what is essential is that the money, the dowry price is paid by the offending man. Now, I know there are a whole lot of questions that this interpretation of this verse raises. But one thing is absolutely clear. Sexual relations do not constitute marriage in the sight of God out of these verses or in the sight of anyone else. And I have had to counsel in this area in this very meeting, and I know that some are hurting in this area, and their consciences are wrecked in this area. Now, those local traditions of dowries uh, have passed, haven't they? And I know you fellas, when you get married, you go stark raving crazy at all the tremendous presents you get. And you're jumping up and down when the fridge comes in and the new this, that, and the other. You can't believe it. You wish you'd get married a lot earlier. Don't you worry, fella. You'll go to enough weddings in your life where you'll give every one of those back again. A friend of mine in County Armagh told me that once, and I've never forgotten it. Don't you worry, Derek, he says, you'll give it all back. Well, I know that those traditions don't exist any longer, but the biblical of the dowry, but the biblical principle in there still exists. It teaches us that the law should protect the rights of the sexually wronged. But do you, if you have wronged this girl, my friend, do you owe her something? Sure you do. You owe her an apology. You say, is that all? No, no. You owe it to her to quit fooling with her or him tonight, fellas, girls on either side, not to make it any more difficult than you already have. Quit fooling. Now. And you owe it to consider carefully before God what the future of your relationship ought to be. But remember, two people have to be willing to marry before marriage takes place. There should be no arm twisting by parents or anybody else or working on someone's guilt feelings for that can be the highway to a wrecked marriage. Do not force someone to marry you by making him feel guilty. Your feelings of guilt are not a good basis for marriage. Marriage may, in fact, add to the wrong that you are doing by plunging two people into a life, a life of chaos and torture. And I'm telling you, when years later anything goes wrong, the beginning of a marriage is never forgotten by either partner. When doubts arise in the girl's mind about her husband's love, she'll find herself saying, well, he married me because he had to. He really doesn't love me anymore. And now he's regretting it. Perhaps he didn't really love me, even when we were married in the first place. And that becomes a raging torment in our life. 
On the other hand, when the man begins to feel trapped by a false sense of obligation, he may say, well, she was at least as much to blame as I was for what happened. And so you have deep problems. Now, I'm not arguing that such a marriage should be dissolved. God knows I am not. Rather, I am making the point that everyone involved in that kind of situation where there has been a physical union, premarital sexual relations before a marriage has come, should think hard before marriage takes place. And if you're in such a situation and married because, as we say in Ireland, you had to, God doesn't have answers for you too, my friend. And you have to discuss with each other those fears and resentments that trouble you and deal with them before God, those inner resentments, and have it out together but before the Lord. But face them. Don't sweep them under the carpet or they'll grow into a raging furnace in your marriage. And one point, one very clear point. What about abortion? Well, I am not qualified to discuss all the labyrinth of questions raised regarding abortion. But one thing for me is absolutely clear. There is nothing whatever to justify abortion as an easy way of dodging embarrassment or shame. And if all that is at stake is your pride or your reputation, then you are destroying more than a potential life. You will be destroying your integrity. Be you the parent who is advising that abortion or the girl who is accepting it. If you abort that baby because of physical union and pregnancy before marriage, it is a dreadful thing to do and a sin before the Lord if that's the reason why you do it, to avoid shame. I talked to a mother this summer. She told me about her lovely Christian girl who had gone away from home and this thing had happened to her and she had an abortion. She's now back to her mother, back home, and trying now to live for the Lord. And she said, Derek, you want, to, you want to live with the guilt that that girl lives with because she did that. And if my voice being raised gently and sympathetically tonight can influence in the Spirit one girl and save you from endless guilt, despite the pressure on you, then I would say to you from the depths of my heart, this whole series is worth it. But remember, no arm twisting to marriage based on someone's guilt feelings. And if you are feeling guilty, recognize where your guilt feelings come from. I know there are hundreds feeling guilty tonight as they look into my face. Those of you watching video across the world, wherever you may be, I know that this hurts. And you say, if you only knew my heart, I know that God perhaps can forgive me, but I can't forgive myself. Now look, if those guilt feelings are coming because God's Holy Spirit is convicting you of sins committed, then do something. Confess your sins to Him. And if your attitude or rather, it is your attitude of repentance and faith that matters before God. It's your attitude of repentance and faith. Other people may not understand you. Other people may down you, cut you off socially, send you to Coventry, and so on. But we see the situation, as we'll see it later with David. Although his sin brought endless trouble into his life, the Lord forgive him. And I want to tell you, my friend, there's forgiveness for you. It's your attitude of repentance and faith that matters. Firmly and boldly tonight, by faith, if you are trusting Christ as your Savior and you've fallen into this situation, go into the holiest of all. You'll find an open and loving welcome. 
if you are this evening coming into God's presence on the basis of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus at Calvary for you. And thirdly, recognize that not all guilt feeling arises from true guilt. The Holy Spirit can convict you tonight of immorality and sin in your life, and you can break it by the Lord's power and come to live a life of purity and power for God. But I want to tell you, young folk tonight, and boy, do I know this, and millions of others, Satan can accuse you too. In fact, let's go to Revelation 12 for a moment. Revelation 12 and 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Every time you go to your knees, Satan accuses you before God every day and every night. Every day of your life, Satan is saying, Ah, but I know Jimmy, I know Mary, I know Tom. I know Kathleen. I know them. They have sinned. They have broken my law. I know them. I know them. And God says, I know them too. You must not let Satan impede your access into God's presence because you have sinned. You tell him he has no business demanding that you show your admission ticket every time you go into the inner sanctum. He belongs to the wrong outfit. God accepts you if you're a Christian tonight because of his son's death. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, God accepts you because of his son's death. It doesn't matter what people think of you. It doesn't even matter what your lover thinks of you. And she may be looking on you tonight as I preach. It doesn't matter whether she can accuse you or not in this sense. You may still be hurt in spite of your having done everything you can to make amends for a sin. God's acceptance and forgiveness of you are not based on these things. They are not based on your sincerity, on your genuineness of your spiritual endeavors, but ever, only, and always on the merits of the Lord Jesus. That is where God forgives you. That's why the Anglican clergyman wrote, Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Foul I to that fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die, says the hymn. It is in Christ's merits and in Christ's merits alone. And God invites you to him because his son died for you. And Christ's death and Christ's death alone atones for your guilt. And if you're hiding in there, there's forgiveness for you. You see, Scripture commands holiness. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of living, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I'm afraid that preachers like me have distorted the Scriptures by presenting holiness in negative terms. No. Why do we ask you to be holy? Why does God ask you to be holy? Because he's holy. That's why. Not because it gives you a, a, a face lift or I'll be used better for the Lord if I'm holy or, 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 or this or that or the other. A kind of pseudo-psychological lift to a fuller life if I'm holy. It's far greater than that. Be holy, says God, for I am holy. Christ came to purchase you for that purpose. It is the very evidence not the word guidance in your notes, point 4C. It is the word evidence. It is the evidence of your salvation. It's the only proof that you sincerely love the Lord Jesus. If you love me, said Jesus, you'll keep my commandments. It proves that you're his when you lead a, a, a holy life. It proves that you, you believe God's Word and that you are the Lord's and that you sincerely love him because faith without works is dead. And according to 1 Peter, a converted wife can have a tremendously good effect on an unconverted husband by her very life, her holy life, can influence him and lead him to the Lord. 
And I'll tell you even better than that. It prepares you, Revelation 21, 27. Let's go over to it. 21, 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, nor worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you die an unholy person, death won't make you holy. The angels are holy in heaven. The Lord of heaven is a holy being. Heaven is a holy place. Nothing that defiles will get in there that makes a lie or is an abomination. Now, maybe tonight you love the company of the careless and the worldly-minded and the covetous and the reveler and the pleasure-seeker and the ungodly and the profane. And in your heart, in this great congregation tonight, you don't love the Savior. You love the world. Like a fellow said to me the other day, well, you know, I didn't want to go to hell, so I trusted Jesus as my Savior, but I'm, I'm just, I'm far happier in the pub than I am sort of a church or anything like that. I have no desire to serve him at all. Oh, that's a strange state of affairs. Maybe you think that Christians are far too strict and far too serious. You avoid them. You've no delight in their society. Well, my friend, you wouldn't enjoy heaven because heaven will be filled with an innumerable company of them. Praying, hymn singing, reading. Maybe that's dull to you. But I want to tell you, in heaven they'll be singing forever and ever and ever praises to the Lamb. They will. So you need to let go of the sins for which the Savior died if you're ever going to rejoice to meet him. You must repent of your sins and trust him as your Savior if ever you would breathe celestial air. So why not do it now, tonight, right across this congregation, up there maybe in that, in that overflow tonight. There's a fellow or a girl, a man or a woman, and you're not yet saved. My friend, let those sins go that Christ died for. Trust him as your Savior, and he'll make you holy. It'll be his righteousness that'll cover you. It will be his Spirit that will empower you. You cannot do it on your own. Hide in Christ. He'll cover you in garments of righteousness. And if you're a believer, then let your life be marked holiness unto the Lord, and he'll keep you holy, sexually holy, and pure in this adulterous and wicked generation.